Welcome to another episode of Capital Roots, brought to you by Capital Farm Credit, where we bring you the experts in the ag industry. In addition to a few Texas legends along the way, we're your hosts, Joe Patronella and Clint Cryer. Thank you for listening. Now let's get back to our roots. We are here today. We're glad to have y'all back with us on Capital Roots. We're here today with Dr. Jim Zirkowitz with the Governor Dolph Briscoe Jr. Tall Program, a program that Clint, myself, and many other capital employees have gone through. And uh, we're just going to get to talk to Dr. Jim about uh, the program, what it's done for individuals in agriculture and agriculture advocacy and and the industry at large. So with that, we're going to get going. So... um, Dr. Jim, could you kind of just tell us a little bit about the program and how you got involved with it and how it started? Okay, well, uh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate y'all being here, and I appreciate uh, Capital Farm Credit for being a significant sponsor of this program. Uh, I got in- involved in the program about, I'd say, it was 1998, so that was about 25 years ago. But prior to that, I'd served as a county extension agent for the Texas A&M uh, AgriLife Extension as we know it today in four different counties and I was your county agent when you were a 4-H'er. You were. And, I was a little uh, kid, yes I sir. I remember you had Champion Pig one time too. Actually, you know, I, br- you, I, I brought that belt buckle You brought today. your belt buckle with you? That's 1996. awesome. 1996. I kind of I peaked there. I, 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 I don't think I've ever been downhill since. <laughs> <sir. laughs> yeah, I, I can't believe you remember that. Yeah, yeah I do. Uh-huh. I remember it was a Hampshire pig. It too. was. He was a runt, too. My dad almost didn't let me get him, but yeah, I, remember I worked that. for him. It was a nice pig. And anyway, I, I, uh, that one. <laughs> I, I came here, and I was county agent here in Brazos County 12 years, and I was brought back by O.D. Butler, who at that time was vice chancellor, and he had seen the programs that I had been doing out in Ector County five years out there and at the same time when I was in Ector County I was going to Texas Tech uh, uh, working on my master's and a very proud fact that I did receive it from out west and uh, then Dr. Butler brought me here in 1986 through 98 I served here for 12 years and during that time I worked on my PhD under Dr. Bill Turner in animal breeding beef cattle uh, specifically and I was studying the differences in embryonic differences between Boss Taurus and Boss Indicus cattle. And I've always had a passion for beef cattle, and uh, I thought I wanted to be the state beef cattle specialist, but Dr. Larry Bowman was a specialist at that time, and there wasn't a position open. And, and, un- and fortunately, this position of tall came open. I applied for it, and, uh, and I've been in this position now for 23 years, going on 24 years. Wow. And I've loved really cool. every minute of it. Really cool. Tall's been a, a, a very important part of what I would consider my career. Uh, really developed me and, and really expanded my perspective uh, and made a lot of friends across the state of Texas, which is a big place. And you were in Tall 12, right? 10. Tall 10. Okay. Yes, tall 10 went to China. Yes, sir. Okay. I remember that trip as well, too. I think we did a trip down the Yangtze River on the weekend and saw the displaced people all along the way. We did. Went through the, the Three Gorges Dam. I'll never forget that opening night after the captain's ceremony or whatever it was right. that they called it. We're in, in the middle of China floating down the Yangtze in a boat. And after they do all of their, you know, rigmarole, I'll call it, you know, to welcome you to the boat, they, the next thing I know, the first song that played on the dance floor was Pat Green. <laughs> wave on i think in china <laughs> yeah on the yangtze river <laughs> yeah and, and you know and tall I, I don't remember what the the ratio was but i mean what are we gonna do well yeah. next thing i know they sent uh chinese girls out there and they required that they learn how to two-step with us oh wow yeah it was a lot of fun it yeah. was and it was. Um, and i did it with another tall class just a few years ago that particular trip down the yangtze and i also got to see an outdoor uh uh, theater and them uh, when uh, when China was pulled together by by the leader at that time under one country and it was live with horses and everything it was just spectacular one of the best outdoor amphitheater type events I'd ever seen yeah Clint you mentioned uh, it was good for your development but you also mentioned that you made friends yeah. um, I'd been wanting to do this program for years but I was in private practice and as an attorney you know you're constantly billing hours and so I, I never could make it work but when I came to work for Capital they were gracious enough to let me partake and I'm, I'm ever grateful for that but I knew it would develop my professional career and I knew that I'd, I'd learn a lot about agriculture I always say I know the areas of ag that I know but I think my biggest takeaway was 
the friendships I made, which right. which are also professional connections. So it, sure, it, it helps your sure. professional career. It but I had no idea that I would make the close personal friendships I made. I mean, I'm, I have five to six friends that will be lifelong friends that I will call at any time and text every day. That's awesome. And I think that you do a really good job of challenging us and, and bringing to the forefront of our mind in that program to do that. And, and I, I commend you for that. And well, I thank you for thank, that. Well, thank you. And uh, and let me just say this, uh, we uh, conducted a, a survey over the first 13 classes eight years ago, and um, we've got some data from that. And then we just now recently done the last four classes again, and we're going to compile, compile that information. Uh, it says in there about 86% of the people have a better understanding of the policies and the issues. And another 86 to 90% have gotten actively involved in actual policy mm-hmm. and advocacy and trying to help promote and educate about Texas agriculture, U.S. agriculture, and what's happening on the world stage. Yep, yep. Speaking of the world stage and agriculture, one of the things we want to talk about is our passion for agriculture. And I think uh, it goes without saying that the three of us, as, as well as everyone that we, we represent with Capital Farm Credit or even within the TALL program, I would say the passion for agriculture is, is uh, beyond any. Uh, I'd be curious, could you just talk about what makes you passionate about agriculture? Well, uh, I grew up in agriculture. I'm a fifth-generation Texan. Uh, my family's been in farming and ranching since we came here from Europe. And uh, I, uh, I'm first generation to go past the seventh and eighth grade on both sides of my family, and all I knew was ag. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love science, and I loved uh, mathematics at the time. And uh, uh, all I knew is I wanted to go to the biggest and best ag school that was close to me, and at that time it was Texas A&M, just right here, and it was only 60 miles away. And uh, I, 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 you know, grew up around ag. That's all I knew. <coughs> mm-hmm. And so when I had an opportunity to come here, Texas A&M opened my eyes. I was on the meats judging team, live judge, livestock judging team, the meats and livestock evaluation team. I got to travel the world. My good friend John Bellinger with AgriWest International and Food Safety Net, uh, the CEO of that company, was on my meats team. And he loves to tell the story that the first time that uh, we got to Abilene, and, and this poor country boy from the countryside had never been out of Waller or Chapel Hill, Texas, and I saw those big hills there in Abilene, and I looked up and I said, is that the Rocky Mountains? <laughs> and they just cracked up. And, and John Bellinger loves to tell that story in public. And matter of fact, he had a big fundraiser the other day, and they were telling stories on on, on Jimmy Mazurkiewicz. But, but my name is Jim, and I go by Mazurkiewicz, but he knew what my, my official uh-huh. name was in, in, uh, in our native language. But but they like to tease me about that. But, yes, I've been agriculture a passion, uh, advocate and been passionate about it my entire life. I still love it to this day. I love this program that we call TALL, the Governor Dolph Briscoe program. Uh, it, the young people that come in here energize me to try to do a better job and try to stay in front of them because, gosh, these guys that come to the TALL program, they're leaders already. I mean, they're not right out of school. The average age is 36, and these guys have got 15 years' experience. And, uh, and they're on top of it. And uh, like I said, I've had to learn to use the iPhone. I've had to learn how to use a computer a few years ago and a few things like that. And trying to stay in front of these guys or at least with them, it's kind of, it's exciting and certainly challenging for me. And agriculture, gosh, that's where the heart and soul of America is. Definitely. Well, aside from passion for it, you know, a lot of the stuff I've been privileged to just roll out of the current, the last class, and you know, we have another person in capital within the current class. A lot of the stuff we focused on was ag issues, and yes. and one of the main things that was recurring, aside from labor and high input costs, was the urban-rural divide. Exactly. And I think one of the things that I found was instead of us versus them, it's us and them. And that I, I think that can be a hard thing in ag because yes. we work so hard to put that food on their table and we work so hard to provide for them. But I always found that you were really good about stressing working with them. Right. Can you talk about that perspective and how you advocate for that and, and stress that? Because you were really good about that, and I'd like for our listeners to hear that. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Joe. Uh, well, first off, let me just say this. What I like to start out with, it, every hour we're losing 197 acres of prime farmland in the United States. Every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And why is that? Because our, our big metroplexes were all built where there was good land and access to water. 
And so there, those areas are starting to grow and we're covering them up with beautiful homes and concrete and roads and things like that. And this is something that we need to be aware of because ladies and gentlemen, only 3% of the world is tillable today. And we're covering quite a bit up of some of the most prime land in the world. And it is an urban and a rural issue because how are we gonna feed the world as we move forward? 75% of the world is water. And the other 22% is deserts and mountains. So only 3% is, is available to us to farm unless we figure out how to farm out in the, in the seaside somewhere. And that may be coming as well. But uh, we've got to make this as, a, as a, a joint issue, a joint problem uh, that we've got to address. I looked on the phone on the way in here today. We're up to 8 billion people. We've actually reached that number quicker than we thought. Uh, we said by 2050, we'd have 9 billion. We're gonna have more than that by 2050 because that's what they kept preaching a few years ago. And, I, and so we all take for granted when we go to our local grocery store that everything we want is gonna be there in season, year round. I can remember growing up that, uh, you know, sweet corn only came in in the summertime during season. Only watermelons were one time a year. Strawberries were one time a year. Well, you can get what you want any time of the year now because we're procuring food now from 72 to 75 countries around the world. That's, there's a season going on somewhere all the time. And, uh, but we've got to help our urban cousins understand that, uh, uh, that uh, we've got to rule with science and hard facts and not with emotions and perceptions. Yep. And uh, we point. have got to continue to emphasize that because everything that you hear someone uh, being passionate about, if they can't back it up with science and facts, that we might ought to check that out before we go and push that agenda or that particular policy. I think we've got to do a better job of helping promote those ideas and not maybe overburden people with too many numbers that, you know, and then they get confused. But some of the basics that, that are out there about what is nutritious, what is healthy, uh, what is uh, how it's grown and because we again we live in a country with the cha safest cheapest most wholesome food supply in the world second to none mm -hmm. yep. and yep. we take that for granted and during yep. COVID I yep. think we ha that was a wake-up call yep so what you're saying there obviously passionate about it something that we're passionate about I know but it makes me have a simple question where does your food come from yeah where does it come from well it comes from your people, they're ag producers from around the world. And we're very fortunate in this country, 95% of our protein is still raised in this country. And 100% of our grains are still raised in this country. We import though, probably about 38% of our fruits and vegetables, but they're coming because people want those things that are all year round and not seasonal. But we're very blessed in this country that our proteins that we're producing them right here. And that's yep. our beef, pork, yep. chicken, turkey, et cetera. I'm curious to know, and this may be dicey for you because of your donors and, and all of every, every, yeah. different, every different session, but at least Clint and I can answer this because okay. we're bystanders. And, and I would like for you to chime in if you can, but if you can, I understand. Clint, what was your favorite session? If, if you can remember that far back, you know. I'll be honest with you. My favorite session had to be the overseas session. When he started, we oh, knew. Oh, that's a cop-out. What is your favorite? Oh, you want to uh, in, in, limited to? Yeah. I mean, I mean, if we put boundaries on it, okay. Yeah. Well, the most entertaining one was the one in Austin when Dr. Jim fell on the, the frozen steps of the Capitol and <laughs> broke his arm. And I've got the scar here. <laughs> oh, wow. I almost lost my hand. And we okay. didn't have, we lost, uh, we lost power in the hotel, had no heat in a, one of those. That was your class. Yeah. <laughs> because it's always the Freeze January up. session around the lake. Yeah. 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 But really, really go back to what I was going to start this with. The, the international session, we, we were going to China. We knew that when we interviewed, when we applied for the program. I wasn't necessarily, I thought, man, John, I'd rather go to New Zealand or Australia or mm -hmm. something that, you know, had a little bit more appeal to it. Yeah. But after going over there, I had uh, the time of my life. But the, the thing that I left there, uh, I'd go back, number one. But the thing that I left there, understanding much better. You know, we live in America. And the thing that we forget is that we try to impose our American values on peoples and people groups around the world. Yeah. I don't know whether that's the right thing to do. You know, you, it's hard to understand another culture, another government, uh, another part of the world, unless you've actually been there and seen it, touched it, and lived it yourself. And I've been privileged enough now to have been around the world three different times and on every major continent, um, every major government in the world. And it's... The first time I went off internationally and came back with a tall group, 
I wanted to get down on the tarmac and kiss the ground and say thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be born in this great country. Yep. Uh, you know, we have our differences, but we can agree to disagree in this country and then solve something without bloodshed and uh, come to some agreement and move forward. Uh, we, you don't have those rights until you, in other countries, and you, it, it's not, you did, you're not quite aware of it until you've actually seen it and, and actually been there, just as you were saying. Yep, yep, yep. So I know it's kind of a cop-out to use the international, but that was really the biggest impact. I mean, to understand what it's like for somebody on the opposite side of the world, how they live, how they find their food, how their food gets grown, completely different. Well, that's a great answer. What uh, about you, Joe? Well, what was your thought you'd never ask, Lynn. <laughs> um, well, I just really love Texas. And so I liked a couple of the various Texas sessions. I think our class was the first that had gone to South Texas in what you said, 20 years? Yeah, at least 12. Yeah. yeah. So um, I just was very unfamiliar with any of the agriculture down there. I mean, the closest I get to South Texas is that my aunt lives on North Padre Island. So that, you know, <laughs> there's not much agriculture on North Padre yeah. Island. Um, but I really, I just loved going to Amarillo. I don't know why, but I, mm -hmm. it made me fall in love with that town. I, I love it the, up there on the Cap Rock. Right. The, it's still the West up there. It is. I, I it just, is. I, I fell in love with Amarillo. If I, if I could take all my cows and move Bryan College Station and move them. Yeah. Yeah. To Potter and what is Randall? Yeah. Yeah. Counties. I would. I'd go up there in a heartbeat. That, it, it made me fall in love with Amarillo. So those two were my favorite. What, what kind of cattle do you have? The ones that would not survive up there. <laughs> <That's curious. laughs> so my bulls would, but yeah, my cattle would not. Yeah. <laughs> so a question back for Dr. Jim. And not only do you represent agriculture, but you're involved. Could you talk about your personal operation? Well, uh, well, I'll just say this. I've had cattle my entire life. And my dad had cattle and my grandparents and so forth. And they, we, my grandparents and great-grandparents, et cetera, were cotton farmers and had few beef cattle. And, and my dad got a lot bigger than that later. But... Uh, I was in the show calf business for about 30 years, and about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I sold out. I guess it was 2011, and I, I was my kids were grown. I was burned out, and I, you know, I was running quite a few cows, and uh, so I sold out, and I just kept a few. Well, my kids kind of got me back into it again about two years ago, and so I'm in the purebred Charlet business, and I'm trying to raise, uh, and I have raised, and we've been successful already uh, with several champion Charlet heifers that we've been putting out. I'm putting in about 20 embryos. I'm buying some of the best genetics offered in the U.S. A lot of it goes back to Thomas breeding up in South Dakota. And uh, we've been very, very fortunate and very successful. And I, uh, <clears throat> using IVF, I'm buying uh, like sexed female embryos and putting them in. The average on that is about 30% conception. We've been getting 67%. And um, I uh, really appreciate the help of the local animal science department and, and uh Dr. Kai Polar over here gave me a few pointers, and certainly in nutrition and just good management made a difference. Awesome. I'm glad you're back in the Charlet business because when I was a kid, where the Chevy dealership is on the highway, you used right. to have your Charlet. So you yes. are the Charlet industry in my mind, Dr. Jim. <laughs> well, thank you. I was the biggest cattleman in the city limits of Bryan, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> in the city limits, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I was the only one. Uh, <laughs> <But anyway. laughs> So, Dr. Jim, we know about how it is, the, the process getting into tall, but for any of the listeners that may not, that may be interested, because I, yeah. I think we'd both implore anyone to get involved in it. Definitely. Can you tell us a little bit more about the application and interview sure. process? Sure, I'd be happy to. It's gotten to be extremely competitive. You know, with the first class, uh, I'll go back to tall one. We had uh, 24 or 25 applicants back then. I wasn't a director at that time. But I think we probably had 24 or 25 applicants. But anyway, we went ahead and, but they were all outstanding people. They were kind of self, uh, how do I say, uh, selected, you know, to go through the process. Today, we'll have over 400 nominations. Uh, we'll get 50 to 60 strong applications and we'll interview and we'll take about 24 to 26. And it's an actual competitive event. It's not a everybody gets in kind of thing. And, uh, and so the, the, big, the big factor is the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interview. During COVID, we did it by, uh, by virtually, and this last one we did as well. We're gonna go back to the face-to-face -face again, where you're sitting in a room with your peers, six to eight former uh, tall alumni and major sponsors and board members in the room, and you'll be interviewed for an hour asking questions about policy, 
about markets, about trade, about you and your experience, what your vision is, uh, and well, how do you see the future, and what, what are you doing for a living, and, and how are you advocating for agriculture back home? And I think, you know, as, as we talked in tall before, and you've heard me say this before, all politics is local. Yep. And uh, you've got to get involved in your community. All politics is grassroots. Tall does not get involved actively in politics. We study the issues. We don't take the issue. Because we're not like Farm Bureau, cattle raisers, or the Corn Board, or somebody like that that can uh, go ahead and lobby. But what Tall was set up for is for us to give an opportunity to study the issues and help educate and inform our future advocates, our future lobbyists, our future uh, uh, people that represent uh, most of the 60 different ag organization boards that we have. I'm very proud to say probably 75% of the CEOs of all the ag commodity groups in Texas are Tall alumni, and over 50% of their board of directors are. And they'll be sending or identifying or recommending different people uh, uh, to get into tall and go through that opportunity, that two-year experience, because they come out with a better understanding of the policies. And the key thing is the relationships. And y'all brought that up a couple of times in the contacts. It's not always what you know is who you know to call sometimes. You don't have to know everything in life to be successful. You just have to be honest and, and, and admit to yourself, you don't know it, but you know someone that does, and reach out. And then you, that just makes you that much more effective. Yeah, there's a, there's a proverb that I really like to live by. It says, plans fail for lack of counsel. With many <laughs> advisors, they succeed. So I think that yeah. really illustrates yes. exactly what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. It takes us all it takes to us get all. things done. Nobody, we can't be an expert in everything. And, and if you'll notice your classes, what they look like, Okay, there'll be somebody from every corner of the state, from every service industry <clears throat> commodity group. It's going. It, what I've always said, I want each class to mirror the state of Texas mm -hmm. and the ag industry. Everything from production to farming and ranching, all the way through the service industries, uh, and and you know everybody that's involved from A to Z. In other words, from the the Brookshire brother H E B folks all the way down to the consumer from the farm gate to the plate. I mean, mm -hmm. I want someone representing all that. you know all gate the way to through. Plate. Yeah. So, Doctor Jim, we've all been through the program, but for anyone who's listening and might not have, can you walk us through what a typical session would look like? Maybe you know when we get there, what we would do throughout the days if there's evening events. Okay. Well, what we're trying to do in Tall is to uh, introduce you to the issues of each of the regions of the state, East Coast, West Coast, uh, ag policies in Austin that affect our state, ag policies on the national level in Washington, D.C., and then there's the international component at the end. And each session, you're going to, and what I've tried to do is where you could see the commonalities of what we have in common. We have more in common than in different. Let's say between corn producers and cattle feeders, between cotton producers and uh, people with Texas nursery and landscape. We all have some common issues we can work together. My goal is to bring all of agriculture together to understand how we can work together for policy, good policy for agriculture on the state and national level. When we bring everybody together here to College Station, we want them to understand what are the agencies that are here in the a and system that work for everybody in the state. We have four great agencies. One is Extension, one is Research, one is the Diagnostic Lab, and the other is the Forestry Service. And all those are agencies for all of Texas. They happen to be housed here at the land grant, but they work with everybody. I want you to understand what resources are available to you, to your producers, to your customers. It's also a time where we bring everybody together and we do some uh, leadership and team building. We do the ropes course and we do some of that so that we can let our hair down and leave our titles at the door mm -hmm. and come in there and just get to know each other yep. and understand each other a little bit and start to build that bond and that, and that friendship. We also do a little bit of what's happening here in the Brazos Valley. It's a, it's a big agricultural region, but when you go to uh, Lubbock and Amarillo, you're going to find out it's mega agriculture down big there. Big ag, like you call You go it. to South Texas, you're going to find out it's subtropical, and there's different crops down there. Here we focus on, 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 uh, on cotton here. We've got uh, grain sorghum. We've got some corn. But this is a big cattle-producing area and a big poultry-producing area. And so we've got one of the largest egg producers in the state of Texas just a few miles from where we're sitting here. You've got one of the biggest hatcheries for chicks to be sent around the world. When we were in China with Clint that time, we were in an egg-laying place, and I asked them where they buy their chicks from, and they said, Hale Hatchery, Brian, Texas. 
and we were in China. And how ironic and how you know uh, indifferent is that? I mean, that just was totally shocking to me. And uh, but we try to show what's available, what's going on in this region, and like I said, team building, getting to know each other. We'll go out to dinner with you know 25, 26 of the local ag leaders here. We'll go down here, down to the Brazos River, down here where a lot of our uh, uh, cotton is grown and some of our other row crops and things like that, and listen to what the farmers' issues are. And you're going to find a common thread throughout the state. And I wanted to make sure that they, it, this class hears that over and over again to understand what we have in common. Water is an issue. Labor is an issue. Immigration, overregulation, cost of inputs. Those things like that are common threads that we all face, whether you're growing uh, trees for the urban public or whether you're growing cotton down here in the Brazos Bottom or the big cotton patch up in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, again, when we, uh, we do that first session, the second session, we go to mega agriculture, Lubbock and Amarillo. Now, Lubbock's the largest cotton patch in the world. Amarillo is the largest concentration of cattle feeding in the world. You've got all the major commodities in the world that you could think of right there. But then when you come down here to South Texas, you've got sugarcane, you've got citrus, you've got things down there that you wouldn't have somewhere else. So in Texas, we can grow just about anything anybody can grow around the world. We've got 13 experiment stations around Texas for that very reason that we can duplicate a research project that we want to cooperate for anybody in the United States or, if, or even some of our uh, uh, larger corp ag corporations that are working on things throughout the world. So to summarize, how many total meetings are there in a two-year, it's a two-year commitment? It's a two-year commitment, it's a 24 months uh, a commitment, but it's in three calendar years on purpose okay. because uh, some people that may not work for themselves may have to take annual leave and some have, so that way I've got it in three calendar years where they could take enough vacation or they could attend all the sessions. Uh, now there are nine sessions. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, Washington, D.C. <coughs> East Coast session. There's a California session, an international session, then six in-state sessions. So we do College Station. We do Lubbock Amarillo. We'll do uh, the Houston Gulf Coast. We'll do South Texas. We do East Texas. And, uh, and then we'll do Austin, which is uh, state policy, and we'll go out to the Edwards Aquifer to understand the water issues out there. We talk about... Uh, uh, mesquite encroachment out there. We talk about high fencing and white-tailed deer. That's part of agriculture too, is wildlife management. Mm -hmm. It's a great supplemental income to a lot of our ranchers out there in West Texas and actually throughout this great state. So uh, we basically study, uh, study, we go to East Texas as well, Tyler and Nacogdoches. We have a large forestry industry that nobody really knows unless you're from East Texas. But in East Texas, poultry, por uh, forestry, and, and horticulture, the three biggest uh, cash crops out there in that part of the state. Cow-calf is that big too, but actually the horticulture cash receipts is bigger than the beef cattle. Yep. Well, I think that was the one that opened my eyes the most because I've gone to East Texas maybe twice in my life, and that was a whole nother world. And, and, and some of those folks in our class that were from the panhandle, they got claustrophobic <laughs> from all the trees, yep. you know? Yep. So the, the, the educational aspect, we all learn from the different areas of the state that we don't produce or work in and and it was just it's fascinating but you know what's even interesting glenn and you may back me up on this even people when we go to lubbock amarillo that are from lubbock amarillo get to see and learn some things that they drive by every day that didn't even know was there or There's, what was inside those buildings no doubt. and the same thing happened here in the brazos no valley that we get the opportunity because uh you know the tall program is very blessed that no one basically has ever told us no and and they're very welcoming us that you can come in as a professional group that you might not get in there by yourself yep so you get me a little fired up and to go back to something that that joe led with is he's about texas but i was just thinking as you were talking about what what all we lead in has anybody ever looked at what we don't have in texas uh <laughs> I don't know. I have to think about that one. I think, I I think when we were in California, they mentioned that they lead in like nuts. Well, they were well, the number For one sure. almond producer in the world. We don't have a commercial almond production here yet. But I must say this, 25 years ago when I was county agent in West Texas, I said, why don't we have a, 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 a wine or grape industry here? People just laughed at me. And look, look at it where today. we are now. Look at it today. Yeah, yeah. And because the and then olives is another thing that is starting to happen out in West Texas as well. The climate is perfect for that out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the water is going to be the limiting issue. Yeah. But 
What county in West Texas were you an agent in? I was in Extra County, Odessa, Extra. Gotcha. the old, big all patch out there, Midland, Odessa. And mm-hmm. I, I was out there five years. I still got great friends there. And as a matter of fact, one of my former 4-H'ers is uh, the professor for sheep and goats here at Texas A&M in the Animal Science Department. And I led him around on the Livestock Judge team, Sean Ramsey, Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey. Yeah, he, he taught me he, Animal Science 101. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Well, he, I've been around a while. So, And now the vice president in charge of education and scholarships at the San Antonio uh, a livestock show and rodeo is one of my students as well, and that's John Henderson. Okay. And I helped him get on years ago, and he's an attorney as well. And he's one of my 4 H boys from out there as well. Yep. So if we were to consider, you've been doing this how many years, or what's the tall program? Uh, uh, 20, uh, 24 years. 24 years. If we, if we consider your past 24 years, what are some milestones and what, what are some stories that you'll never forget? Well, let me just say this the opportunity to meet Governor Dolph Briscoe was one big one for me. He was the ninth, when he passed, he was the ninth largest landowner in the United States. He served as chairman of the board from the very beginning, 1987 to 2010. He passed away in June 2010. And he was a, 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 a bigger than life kind of fellow, but very quiet. But when he spoke, he was kind of like E.F. Hutton, everybody listened. But let me just say this, without, I got to know him, work with him for 12 years. and. Um, he was a person that without him lending his name and his reputation, this program would have never come out of the ground. And I was doing a little reading about the history about this program. Uh, there was discussion about it in 1985 in Texas, but actually these programs started in 1965 in Michigan, in Michigan State. There was programs pro- like this? This eight, the first program like this. Okay. And uh, so they went to Kellogg Foundation and got it funded. And in 20 years, they were end up funding 10 different programs. And then they decided to move on to something else. Well, Texas decided that they wanted to do this. Uh, uh, Dr. Mallet and Dr. Rusink, who's still here, he's a professor emeritus here in the community, uh, uh, went to a, a meeting and brought it back to the director of extension. And so Zerl uh, Carpenter was director at that time. So he reached out to a retired dean from New Mexico State who was a friend of his that, uh, that he reached and asked him to come back here to head this program up in 1985. And they met uh, with uh, Eugene Butler. Uh, uh, he was uh, editor emeritus of The Progressive Farmer. And, uh, and then, then at that time, Charlie Scruggs was the editor of Progressive Farmer. And uh, Charlie says, what we need to do is get a named person to, to head this thing up, and then we'll be able to get other people to come in the room to help us start building some monies, some funding for it. Because you got to remember what was going on in, 19, in the 1980s. There were budget cuts. There was uh, cuts at the state level and different things like that. There were no new monies out there. And here we are trying to start this program that cost $30,000 per person to run them through the program. Mm-hmm. And so they went to, to Governor Briscoe. He was retired, second time governor at that time. He said, yes, let's do it. So they had a meeting in September of 86 in Austin, Texas. And what's interesting today, one of, there's a couple of guys still living to this day. Uh, Roddy Peoples is still on the board, the voice of Southwest Texas. And Marcus Hill was a very young CEO of Ag Workers Insurance. And today he's chairman of the Tall Foundation, and we're very proud to have Marcus on board. But, but Dolph said, are we going to do this? And everybody in the room that came that day, and there was the who's who of Texas agriculture that was there, and they said, let's do it. And they started raising money. Up until about two years ago, Eugene Butler, who was the uh, uh, editor emeritus of Progressive Farmer, had given more money individually than any one person. And then Mr. Pruitt passed him and then passed away two years ago as he was sitting chairman of the board. But the biggest gift giver to date today is the, uh, the Briscoe family with the endowment. Mm-hmm. Today, our program, I'm proud to say, we're the only entity in the College of Ag, probably the only one in the United States, not just here, that's 100% self-funded. And that's the salaries for the two for the people that run the two people, my two assistants and myself. That's salaries, insurance, and benefits, and that's also monies that we have to raise every year, soft monies that the industry has been doing 100% since we started this program in '87. Uh, we have to raise those monies, just like y'all, uh, Capital Farm Credit's a major sponsor, amongst many others that we're very proud to have. And uh, so I'm proud to say that this program does not cost a penny, but the benefits and the impact is priceless that is made on this state. Currently, we have 450 alumni. Uh, We have 26 more in this new class. But as a result, we've started another program for faculty, 
called the Extension Leadership Program, and then I have a third one now for students. And then we've initiated one called the Mile High Program at Texas Tech after this program. And then out of uh, Dr. Skagg's office, we've initiated another one like that. But since I've been here, we've run 1,000 leaders through these programs, and I'm very, very proud of that fact, 1,000. And these are two-year programs, and that's a lot of people, a lot of time. Lot of and what's interesting for people out there today there is 500 hours worth of training in this two period, uh, this two year period. That's over 60 classroom hours more than you would spend obtaining a master's at any major university in the United States. 60 classroom hours more. That's not counting the homework, the thank you notes that y'all have to write and all those kind of things like that. Some of the readings that you've done, but I'm um, actual, uh, get, and then getting to meet 300 plus speakers of the, you know, who's who, of Texas and U.S. agriculture. The, uh, the, uh, the receptions that we have, we have 10 receptions. I'm real big on building relationships and getting the who's who of every region. So every region in the state that we go to, whether it's uh, in Washington or wherever we're at, we're gonna try to meet who the leadership is. You're gonna meet over 3,000 key people mm -hmm. in this program in that two year period of time. I will send out your narratives to over 1,000 people every three months. That goes out every time with, uh, so that people can keep up with what we're doing, the new information, the new, new, new issues, different policy. How is these policies affecting East Texas versus West Texas? How are the people in California handling different uh, uh, inputs and com commodity prices, markets, the international markets today? You know, something can happen like in Ukraine today. And look what we have all have learned to pay attention to international politics international countries at war and things like that, and the supply chain issue of COVID that now is carried over into this war in Ukraine. Uh, I think it's opened everyone's eyes, and I think it's a key moment in time for TALL and our TALL alumni and other advocates for agriculture to tell our story while we have everyone's attention, paying attention to what's going on, because when the grocery store shelves were empty two years ago, yep. that was a wake-up call <clears throat> to America and to the world that it just doesn't make the orange juice back there in the back of H-E-B or Brookshire Brothers or Kroger's or whatever. It just doesn't happen back there in the back. Somebody's out there farming every day. And what was interesting, our farmers and ranchers were working every day through COVID when some of us were working from home or not at all. Yep, where does your food come from? Where does your food come from? Our farmers and ranchers out there. And you cannot forget the transportation, part of this thing those people didn't stop working either and the people that were moving goods from a to z we've got the best infrastructure in the united states of any country in the world and i've learned that on our international travels that's what also has made us a great nation as well as a great opportunity for our brightest and best to get an education where you don't always see that in other countries. Yep. Well, and, and you mentioned the advocacy to make sure that agriculture is seen and, and all the hard work we do. That's part of this podcast, and and that's at, that's part of why we're glad to sponsor programs like Tall. And I think I think it speaks volumes about the quality of Tall that uh, the self funding that you mentioned. And so we we just couldn't be prouder to be affiliated with the program. Well, no doubt. Well, thank you. And I, like I said, I I'm just very blessed to have the opportunity to be chosen to lead this program 24 years ago. I, uh, I still got a few more good years in me because I tell you what, as I told you, the, the young and bright men and women that come through this program are certainly energizing and inspiring that this industry is in good hands. Yep. This industry is in good hands, and, uh, but we've got to tell our story, ladies and gentlemen. There's only 1% of people out there actually as producers out there. The average age of the American farmer is 59 and growing, that is getting older, and, uh, and the farms are getting bigger because of economies of size, uh, because of the type, the marketing system that we're in. I mean, we've got to produce more to make the same amount for a standard of living. Because uh, I know after World War II, everything has changed, and uh, we're having to get bigger and more efficient to keep food prices down. We only spend 9.5% of our disposable income. That's something you'll learn in tall as well. Uh, other countries are spending 33% like Mexico. You're spending 18, 15, 18% in Europe. Uh, China is probably about 35, 40% of their income goes to food. We have the cheapest, safest food supply. But to, to be able to do this cheap food supply that we have, we got to continue to do more with less and continue to, to, do, to get bigger and more efficient. But I think there's going to be a happy medium coming because when we, uh, this current class is going to go to Europe. 
and they have a different foreign policy, and we're going to learn about their foreign policy. We're formulating a new one today, so this current class will be in Washington next spring and getting to hear the input about the new policy and where we're going to go in America. But we've gotten bigger and more efficient here. They learned that in TAL. When you go abroad, especially in Europe, they're highly subsidized. When I was in Germany the last time with the last TAL class, they are operating 10% under the cost of doing business. So they're making that 10% up, and then above that is how they're making a living, just strictly off of subsidies. So what's going to happen when the American public decides to turn and change that they don't want to subsidize in Europe? We have already gotten away from subsidies here, but in other countries have not. And so when these more developed, higher educated people in another country decide to do that, how are they going to do that? They've subsidized the smaller farms. They're not as efficient. But that's a different system, a different food policy, and that's something that you'll be able to learn and, con and compare in this program. Yep, it's pretty awesome stuff. So Dr. Jim, as we kind of wrap this deal up, one of the things that I'd like to highlight, especially as we talked about today, mm -hmm. a lot of the challenges that face not only Texas agriculture, but the U.S. and feeding our, uh, the people that, it, that uh, populate this country. I think Texas is specifically, because of the TALL program, uniquely positioned to do well in that. And I think, number one, it's, I'll reference the the 1,000 leaders that have gone through all of your affiliated programs. And, and one of the things that I had, I had a discussion earlier with a colleague of mine this week, and, and when it comes to leadership, you ought to go loaded for bear. I'm a hunter, so that means a lot to me, but that's, I, th I think that's pretty profound. And I think the tall program has, has prepared Texas agriculture to do that. So we really appreciate you being here today. We ap appreciate the opportunity for Capital Farm Credit to be involved with the tall program. Look forward to visiting with you more in the future about it. Well, thank you for having me, and God bless each of you. And, and it's been a pleasure to get to know you all both through this program. Thank you yes, for sir. having us. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Appreciate it. it. You bet. Thank you for joining us today on Capital Roots. Texas agriculture is the foundation of our story and what makes us family. Capital Farm Credit is a proud member of the farm credit system. We finance farmers, ranchers, agricultural producers, and rural landowners, and we're here to make your vision a reality. We've been serving rural Texas for more than a century. Whether it be traditional, innovative, or lifestyle, we'll help you cultivate new ground. We're all in this together. Because together, we're better. <laughs>